Now, let's get one thing clear. First and foremost, I think that it's a grave injustice to Holy Mother Church to refer to Luther Zwingli, Calvin Knox, or any other Protestant fountainhead as a reformer. What Luther initiated and what others after him have carried out was not a reformation. It was a revolution. If their goal was to purify the church, which was their claim, let's not get this wrong, they, they, their, their claim, and still to this day their claim, is that they didn't want to start a new church, they just wanted to purify the one that exists, then the means by which to do so, for them, was destruction. The structure, the officers, the orders, the sacraments, the sacramentals, the number of books considered to be canonical, and a myriad of other characteristics of the church were to be eradicated. For the Protestant revolutionaries, nothing short of this would do. Now, contrary to public opinion, reform through destruction, or revolution, was Luther's ambition from the very beginning. If you go back all the way to, 19, or to, to uh, 1518, Luther responded to a letter written to him by a former professor. And this professor had concerns about what Luther was doing and some of the thoughts Luther had and the things he was advancing. Now, here's part of Luther's reply in 1518. Quote, To speak plainly, my firm belief is that the reform of the church is impossible unless ecclesiastical laws, papal regulation, scholastic theology, philosophy and logic as they presently exist are thoroughly uprooted. This uprooting is a resolution which neither your authority, though it is certainly very great for me, much less that of any others, can turn me aside. Luther had made very clear from the very outset in 1518 that his idea of Reformation was nothing short of uprooting those very characteristics and qualities which made the church the church for 1,518 years. What Luther did not anticipate was what would happen were the walls to actually come uh, crashing down. It didn't take long before Luther figured this out. Within a matter of months, the disastrous effects resulting from his beliefs pertaining to the individual's right to private interpretation and the primacy of conscience uh, began to take form. And it was frightening to him. It was frightening because he began to see all of these things slowly begin to, to crop up here and there. Everybody was taking the standard that he had given at Worms. Everyone was using that for every doctrine known to man, for any whim, for any fancy. And he understood that. Doctrinal and moral relativity was rampant. Ecclesiastical pluralism was spreading like wildfire. The seed which he planted at Worms had quickly taken root, and he was not sure how to handle the situation. Now Luther, seeing the revolutionary nature of his protest, decided it best to at least attempt to put an end to the outbreak. Now, who wouldn't want to uh, put an attempt to the outbreak? He was, seeing, he was seeing the first fruits of what we now know as denominationalism, and he saw it as a virus. So Luther, not being an idiot, Luther being a rather intelligent individual, said, I need to put an end to this. So what, was the, what were the means that, that, that Luther employed in order to put a, 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 a halt to rampant denominationalism in his day? Well, popery. <laughs> okay? He went with the one with the Romanist path, is what he did, in a very popish manner. He began to cream what could and could not be believed by those wishing to be saved. Masses were outlawed, and both convents and monasteries were burned to the ground. When Catholics cried out in protest to these actions, this is what Luther said, quote, the, stipula the stipulation made that monks and nuns still dwelling in their cloisters should not be expelled, and that the Mass should not be abolished, could not be accepted. The monastic life and the Mass cover with infinite ignominy the merit and suffering of Christ. Still, it's one thing, it's one thing to, to destroy, and it's a completely different thing to replace. And Luther began to realize that, that seeing now that he's destroyed all of these things, he had to replace it. Okay? He had to become an architect. And that's what he was. He was a theological architect. That's what every schismatic and every heretic eventually has to do. 
They have to build up where they've destroyed. Okay? Now, he decided that his newly formed confession, penned by Melanchthon, would be the new standard which all Christians, in all times, in all places, must adhere to. Hear Luther's words. Let's quote him again. Quote, The Augsburg Confession must endure as the true and unadulterated word of God until the great judgment day. The council could be accepted only on condition that this confession be acknowledged as true apart from any conciliar authority. Not even an angel of heaven could alter a single syllable of it. And any angel that dared to do so must be cursed and damned. Still less might emperors, popes, and bishops sit in judgment on it. He went on elsewhere to insist this. He said, I do not admit that my doctrine of sola fide can be judged by anyone, not even the angels. Anyone who does not receive my doctrine cannot be saved. It's here that we see beyond any shadow of a doubt. What Luther was a revolutionary in fear of other revolutionaries. To make matters worse, he was terrified that they would revolt on the very same grounds that he did. And were he to be consistent, they would have every right to do so. But see, revolutionaries hate power only in so much as they're not the ones in power. But once they get into power, they use the very same tactics that they, that they completely, completely hated and repudiated from the authorities that they revolted and rebelled against. Unfortunately, friends, this revolutionary impulse is just as real today as it was in 1518. Protestants split from one another faster than one can keep up with, and there are more denominations and independent ecclesial bodies than one can shake a stick at. They revolt from one another over issues great and small, but I think it would be rather inconsistent, not to mention unfair, for one Protestant to fault another Protestant who decides, for any reason whatsoever, to separate from ecclesiastical fellowship. For in revolting from fellowship, they are only staying true to their 500-year heritage of revolution. They, like Luther, and all those after him, are bucking ecclesiastical authority, tossing aside church traditions, and replacing a newly created vacuum with their own self-assumed authority, their own self-assumed ecclesiastical jurisdiction all based on what is in harmony with their conscience and private interpretation of Scripture. They're being consistently Protestant. They are being ecclesiastical revolutionaries par excellence.